I did learn something. I learned how consciousless some people could be in trashing a message they don't like. The message is, someone who wants to do the will of God has an unconquerable ally. Teresa can't be defeated. Both Smedlock and Ravi, who are the only two out of these 12 negative reviews who actually read the book, want you to believe Teresa is a lecherous, unprincipled girl. The exact opposite is true, and you can read it for yourself in chapter 4 on my website where Teresa narrates, Girls asked if we'd been bad. That was none of their business, but in fact, we did save ourselves for marriage. We knew we had something special and didn't want to spoil it with regrets. If all people were like Teresa and Steve Hartley, we could disband the police force. Welcome to Club Doom, where I'm almost convinced my patrons have it out for me. Because this video hurt. We had a poll to decide next video topic, and instead of picking, I don't know, the story behind 3DO Doom's development hell, fam voted that I review Empress to Teresa. Yes, that Empress Teresa. The one by Norman Buton. The dude who slid into every book review site and novel discussion forum to ever exist ever so he could defend his big stinker of a book. Something man says he took two whole decades to write. This would be like if Dr. Dre finally dropped Detox and it was just 12 copies of the same mp3 file where Chance Wilkins be covering Sound of Silence. Oh, first time I don't to say I.e. bad. Like, at least when I reviewed Sonichu, I couldn't really predict just just how bad things finna get by the first page. So with that in mind, let's check out the first page of Empress Teresa. I'm Teresa, the younger daughter of Edward and Elizabeth Sullivan, and I hope it's not bragging to say, I was cute as heck at age 10. Everybody in the family said so. I said so. I was the princess in the Sullivan clan of Fra Fra Framingham? Framingham. Because besides being cute, I was a whiz in school and I had it good disposition. All the relatives expected great things from me. Nobody could have ever dreamed of what I would do a few years later, and nobody would have believed it even if they had been told. Prime Minister Blair said I'd still be remembered in a million years. Did you catch that? Churchill, Hitler, and Lincoln will be footnotes in, <laughs> in dusty history books a thousand years from now, and nobody and nobody remembers Charles Martel, who saved Christianity. Number 15, Charles Martel. The last thing you want in your Burger King lettuce is to know that Charles Martel saved Christianity in Europe by winning the Battle of Tours 1300 years ago to set up the world as we know it today. But, um, Prime Minister Blair said I'd be remembered in a million years. Mr. Blair is not inclined to exaggeration. I was the last person you would expect to earn that accolade. I was a nobody from nowhere. When this story began, I was a little girl who didn't have much of a clue about anything. My job as a kid was to figure out what the heck was going on and what to do about it. It's not that easy when you're young. Everything's so brand new. My father once served a tour in the Navy. Yeah, bro, just from that first half of the first page, you can already tell why this John got review bombed to hell upon its release. Bland Mary Sue, who important for being important, kind of like like the author's own personal Paris Hilton or OF model. Check. Ramblings and sidetrackings about nothing. Check. Characters being introduced only to not really do or contribute anything and be pushed to the side so we can ogle over Teresa more. Check. Obnoxiously over-religious undertones. Check. Mentioning Hitler for no reason. Like, I get what Barton trying to do here. Saying, oh, these are... Uh, these men who had a huge impact on history won't hold a candle to the amount of impact Teresa will have. Aight, but why Hitler though? Check. Only 467 and a half pages to go! Ooh, I'm ready! No, not really! So after three or four more pages of nonsensical ramblings about nothing, we finally learn how she get her powers. Cause she has powers in this book. Apparently she was chilling in the backyard when a random fox pull up and hawked a magic loogie in her mouth. So during a massive heat wave, the most inconspicuous surveillance car pulls up down the street from Teresa's home. She learns the government man be tapping her phone, using satellite rays to burn her father's teeth and steal his royal pee. So Teresa and Mrs. Sullivan be chilling at the mall when a random woman hands Teresa her number and tells her to call her when 
and she alone. Again, Teresa's like 10. The government lady and the satellite man tell Teresa that they've been following her for a hot minute as she's been exuding the same level of heat as the magic loogie they've been trying to track down. So it turns out the magic loogie be like this weird alien white orb that finna give her powers. And she names it Hal after the computer from 2001 A Space Odyssey. And one of the first powers it give her be an aimbot. And then Norman wonder why no one like his protagonist. No one likes an aimbotter, bruh. No one likes an aimbotter. She also gets super strength. Matter of fact, white alien cosmetic falls down from outer space, posting itself onto the body of an unsuspecting, much weaker creature giving them superpowers. This just sound like Earthworm Jim, but less interesting and more pretentious. So Teresa, being the devout Catholic girl she is, decides to share her secret, her strange alien demonic possession witchcraft with her priest, Father Donutty. And homie just cool with it. He couldn't care. He just sees her using her super strength to lug and bend horseshoes with her bare hands. And he like, bet. She gets to meet Jan and the Cardinal, two of the government agents who be in charge of watching her and melting her dad's teeth with satellite rays. They have the same long-winded conversation with her about what exactly Hal's supposed to be and why they are watching her over and 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 over. Matter of fact, we still on chapter one. What you thought? That I was skipping chapters or something for the sake of good pacing? Nah. So chapter two, Teresa makes the boys baseball team with the help of her super strength and aimbot. I was on television all the time. Now I learned something about the world. People said bad things about me on the internet. And there it is. Author projection, let's go. I'm already looking forward to the chapters where Teresa be scrapping with like mall managers and jerk ops to defend her right to solicit sex at the mall with an attraction sign. Actually, this is a newer development in the story because this excerpt, dead ass, from the newer editions of the book. Original release ain't mentioned jack about the internet or at least not so abruptly in the middle of chapter two. So so Teresa goes to the principal to complain about all the online trolls and cyber bullies. And the principal tries to console her by relating the situation to a commercial that ain't got jack to do with what they talking about. Would you believe me if I told you the excerpt from the book Equally Ridiculous? I saw why the trolls were angry. They knew they couldn't go where I was going. I'd have a good life. They wouldn't. What they said made no sense. They were really mixed up big time. I blamed the parents for not raising them right. Apparently, the trolling got so bad, six men with handguns drawn got out of these cars and surrounded me. And this is the most overblown out-of-pocket troll op ever. The plan be to kidnap her and fly her on a plane to the middle of the ocean with an atom bomb in it. And people say music biz Marty too hard on Cyrax. So anyway, during one of the 20 pit stops, Teresa snatches like 12 bottles of coke like she about to do a mukbang challenge or something. Something. She hides him in a plastic bag and takes it with her to the jet with the atom bomb. So as she fly into her doom, she empties the coke bottles, seals them vacuum tight, stuffs them in her jumpsuit, yanks open the canopy, and dives out that bitch. I would assume while well, Power by Kanye West be playing in the background. I mean, every superhero need they theme music, am I right? So anyway, she falls 50,000 feet into the Atlantic Ocean using the empty Coke bottles as makeshift flotation devices and basically waits around for a week or two until the British Navy picks her up. Now, why they allowed her to bring a suspect garbage bag onto the jet with her, I don't know. I guess the same reason they gave her a thermal jumpsuit as well as many other accommodations throughout this trip. You know, they only trying to assassinate 
assassinate this bitch in the most over-the-top way imaginable. I can't make her too uncomfortable. So she survives using Baki logic until she doesn't. Cause girl immediately keels over after being rescued. And I'm ending the video with that. Cause this cliffhanger probably the closest thing to tension this story finna get. If you like weird internet stories, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I will catch y'all the next time. Sweet nectar. Simply 